tonight's Conversations with Great Minds, I'm joined by Dr. James Lowen. Dr. Lowen is a sociologist, historian, and author. A graduate of Carleton College, he received his doctorate in sociology from Harvard University. He taught race relations for 20 years at the University of Vermont and has been an expert witness in more than 50 civil rights, voting rights, and employment legal cases. Among Dr. Lowen's many awards and honors is the first annual Spivak Award from the American Sociological Association for Sociological Research Applied to the Field of Intergroup Relations. Dr. Lowen is currently the distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians, a visiting professor of sociology at Catholic University, and a visiting professor of African American Studies at the University of Illinois. He's the author of numerous books including the American Book Award winning bestseller, Lies My Teachers Told Me, Everything Your American History Textbook Got Wrong. Dr. Lowen joins me now in the studio. Welcome, sir. Nice to be here. It's very nice having you with us. What stimulated you early on to study sociology? I think that actually growing up, I was interested, I was just curious about the social world. Uh, for instance, and nobody's asked me that question, incidentally. Uh, I can remember as a little kid, maybe I was 10, uh, I read the newspaper in Decatur, Illinois, my hometown right in the center of Illinois, and there was some story about a house of ill repute. And I'm not sure I knew what that meant. Maybe that was explained to me in guarded terms by my parents. And then I asked my dad if we could drive past it. And dad took us on these Sunday drives. So on this Sunday, we went past the house of ill repute. So maybe it was always there. Uh, I didn't even know what sociology was before I went to college, actually. So it was, it was college that got me into it. Sure, and, and, and led to kind of a history of sociology in a, in, in a way. It, it, well, what got writings. me into history is a different question and a different story. Go for it. Okay, uh, and, and that one uh, I, I have been asked before, and I know the answer. Uh, and that is, my very first full-time teaching job was at Tougaloo College. That's T-O-U-G-A. It's not a very well-known college up here in, in uh, Washington, D.C., but it's a good college, um, very good, and it's in Mississippi, and it's African-American. So I'm teaching the courses I expected to be teaching in sociology, but I'm also pressed into, into service to teach one section of a course called the Freshman Social Science Seminar. So this was a course that had been invented by the history department, in fact, and it was a required course, and it introduced students to, you know, the drill, psych, poli sci, econ, social, etc. And it did this in the context of African American history. Made sense, 99% of our students being African American. Well, that's the same chronology as, shall we say, regular American history. So second semester begins not only right after Christmas, uh, it also begins right after the Civil War. So second semester begins, I have a new group of 17 students that first day of class. I don't want to do all that talk, all the talking that first day. So I ask my students, okay, um, what, what happened during Reconstruction right after the Civil War? What, 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 what went on there? And my, what happened to me was an aha reaction, or I might better call it an oh no reaction, because my, 16 out of my 17 students said to me, that's the time when, right after the Civil War, Reconstruction, uh, blacks took over the government of the southern states. But they were too soon out of slavery, and so they screwed up, and white folks had to take control this is again. Birth of a Nation, the, exactly. the 1903 exactly. movie, as yeah. I recall. Yeah, uh, Birth became... of a Nation, Gone with the Wind, yeah. uh, all rolled into one. And of course, these are all African American students. Um, I thought, my gosh, what must it do to you to believe that the one time your group was center stage in American history, they screwed up? Now, it'd be a different matter if this happened, uh, but it didn't happen. Uh, this is, in fact, what we in sociology call BS history, that is, bad sociology. Yeah. Um, so what, what actually happened, of course, the Reconstruction governments were never taken over by black folks. All of the southern states had white governors throughout the period. All but one had a white legislative majority. Uh, second of all, the governments didn't screw up. Uh, the, without exception, across the South, they wrote better state constitutions than the southern states have now, uh, much better than Texas's, for instance, or, or Mississippi's. Uh, they started the public school systems for, for both races. There were scattered schools for white folks, but no system that included the whole state. And of course, there were no schools at all for black folks. It was illegal, a felony, to teach even free blacks to read and write. So they didn't screw up. So anyway, I, I went to nearby schools. I watched. And this was just before massive school desegregation. So I watched black teachers teaching all black classes this white supremacist history that was complete BS uh, because they were just teaching what was in the book. So I tried for about a year and a half to get 
a historian, or more than one historian, to write a new book. They were too busy doing their little monographs and stuff. So eventually, I got a grant. Um, I put together a team of students and faculty at Tougaloo and also at Millsaps College, which is the nearby white school, and we wrote a new history of Mississippi. Well, this was aimed at ninth graders where this was a required course, and the state rejected our book for not just public school use, for any school use. Uh, we sued them. It the, took that the, all the way to the Fifth Circuit. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, no, it didn't go, they didn't appeal it. Uh, it was in the federal court, of course. Yeah. And the, the case is called Lowen et al. versus Turnipseed et al. Uh, there are people in Mississippi named Turnipseed. Uh, it's one of the reasons we made him the lead defendant. Um, anyway, it was a, a dramatic uh, trial, in fact. And the, the key moment of drama happened with John Turnipseed on the stand. He was one of the seven member uh, Mississippi State Textbook Board, five of whom had voted against our book, including him. There were five whites and two blacks on the board. I think you can figure that one out. Uh, and he was asked by the Assistant Attorney General for the State of Mississippi, why did you vote against this book? Uh, which is a good question, because it was a good book. And he had us turn to page whatever it was, 189, I think, where there was a photo of a lynching. Now, Mississippi, in fact, had more lynchings than any other state. It's a matter of history, and it's important, and it makes a difference in how society operates. Uh, but he said, and I can quote him exactly, I committed it to memory when he, when he said it. He said, now you know some ninth graders, especially black male ninth graders, are pretty big. And we worried, or at least I worried, that teachers, especially white lady teachers, might have trouble controlling their classes with material like this in the book. So our book was going to cause a race war. Well, we had already pre-tested our book with an overwhelmingly white class and with an overwhelmingly black class. And both classes had liked it all to pieces better than their book. Sure. So we had material for rebuttal testimony. But we didn't have to use it because at this point, the judge, who was an 83-year-old white Mississippian who was believing in the First Amendment, students' rights to controversial material like this, uh, and also in the 14th Amendment, the, the Equal Rights Amendment, he took over the questioning and he asked, quote, but that happened, didn't it? Didn't Mississippi have more lynchings than any other state? And Mr. Turnipseed replied, and I quote him, he said, well, yes, but that all happened so long ago. Why dwell on it now? And the judge says, well, it is a history book, and we nudged each other and said, we're going to win this case. Yeah. <laughs> and that was and our did. Perry Mason mo moment. We did win the case. Yeah. Yeah. I I'm curious how, when you first stepped into that class and were confronted by the lack of knowledge among your African-American students about their own history in their state and the misinformation in the textbook, how is it that you knew the, the true story? That's a good question, too. Um, one key reason was that when I wrote my doctoral dissertation, my doctoral dissertation is called The Mississippi Chinese Between Black and White. And it's actually still in print. They made a movie out of it. Not a very good movie, but a movie nevertheless. Um, doing the research for that, I had to learn about the Reconstruction period, of course. Um, and it, it isn't a secret that this whole lie about Reconstruction was just that, a lie. I mean, Historians were coming to that conclusion at about that time, having gotten it wrong for, for many decades. Uh, so that was part of it. But the biggest part of it was uh, I actually read newspapers published in the 1860s and 70s, uh, particularly newspapers in Vicksburg. And this one newspaper in particular was a Democratic newspaper. And of course, you have to remember in the 19th century, the Democrats were the party of overt white supremacy, the, right. the two parties flip -flop, the party finished a flip-flop on this in 64, 1964. Yeah. yeah, they called themselves the white man's party and that's what they were. Well, so this was a democratic newspaper and these newspapers were outspokenly political back then, uh, more so than Fox News, you know. And so they, uh, this guy, the editor, originally starts off utterly upset with Reconstruction just simply because blacks were voting and, and got to participate in the political process. Gradually, he, ex he agrees that they're not that bad. And then he even suggests, well, you know, since uh, blacks are going to be voting from here on out, little did he know that that wasn't going to happen, but since they are, um, maybe we ought to become Democrats and he, I mean Republicans. Mm -hmm. And he switches the paper briefly to become a Republican newspaper. And then um, 
the Vicksburg race riot occurs, which is a which killed a bunch of black folks and pretty much removed them from politics even before the, the state went uh, democratic. And he realizes that we can remove them from politics. And so he switches back to being democratic. And I'm sitting there reading this and saying, OK, this didn't happen then because Republicans were terrible and were destroying the state. Quite the opposite. It happened because they were succeeding. They were building a, an alliance that, that would have kept them in power. And so the Democrats used violence to, to end that. Wow. that so that, that would have been, uh, what is it, Thaddeus Stevens and the radical Republicans and mm -hmm. those folks? And, that, and that, that, that is absolutely remarkable. Of course, he was in Pennsylvania. Would, yeah. that, would that he were in Mississippi. But. Yeah. But, uh, and to the 13th, 14th, and 15th yeah. Amendments. Yeah. The 14th and 15th Amendments were passed then. And the, the 14th Amendment in particular gives us all equal rights under the law, due process. It's a, it, I think it's the crown jewel of our Constitution. I, I, but I, of course, it got forgotten from about 1880 until about 1960. You know? Right. And now, now they're trying to apply it to corporations. Yeah, I know. We'll, we'll continue this conversation in just a moment. More conversations with great minds with Dr. James Lowen coming up right after the break. Welcome back to Conversations with Great Minds with Dr. James Lowen. Dr. Lowen is a sociologist, historian, and author, a graduate of Carleton College. He received his doctorate in sociology from Harvard University. He's the author of numerous books, including the American Book Award-winning bestseller, Lies My Teacher Told Me, Everything Your American History Textbook Got Wrong, and Teaching What Really Happened. Let's get back to it. Um, uh, and also, I want to mention, we talked some about the, the Civil War Re Reconstruction, your newest book, The Confederate and Neo-Confederate Reader, uh, The Great Truth About the Lost Cause. And this is, I, I find this absolutely fascinating. Um, you mentioned that during the break that George Zimmerman quoted you and three dead guys on his website. Uh, in that context, I, and, and, and this seems to be a thread through at least that of your work that I'm familiar with. I've read Lies My Teacher Told Me, and in fact, I interviewed you on the radio some years mm -hmm. ago about this, and, and some of your articles. Um, is this notion of creating the hero and the false hero, ultimately, and how it becomes a, a kind of jingoistic uh, form of, well, nationalism is not quite the right word, but if, sure, it, sure you know, how does that all relate to to George Zimmerman and well, what's going on. I don't know that that relates to George Zimmerman. He, he quoted me on quite a different context. Mm -hmm. uh, it was interesting. He quoted me from Lies My Teacher Told Me on, I think, page 367. Uh -huh. Now, this implies he read the whole book. Um, the book, among other things, it's not all about race, but some of it is, and it seems to me it's certainly intended as an anti-racist book. Yeah. Uh, I think as you read it, you realize, geez, you know, I didn't know that we did that, and I didn't know that that's what happened then, right. and so on. And um, let's just put it this way, the anti-racism didn't seem to have rubbed off on Mr. Zimmerman uh, as he read the first 366 pages. Well, and, and uh, to the extent that he's been reinvented as a hero by some of the folks on, okay. on the right, mm -hmm. and 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 for that matter, Trayvon Martin has been reinvented yeah. as as either the hero or as the villain, you know, by yeah. by some characters. Yeah. We have this tendency in in American history to to deify or villainize way beyond what's realistic. And and you puncture a lot of those yeah. balloons in your books. I'm I'm curious. Do you think that that's a human characteristic? Is that just kind of a callback to tribalism? Or is that something that Americans do more than other countries? I think it's both. Uh, I think that certainly we do it more than others. Uh, and I think there's a reason for that. That is to say, every nation, I think, is ethnocentric. Every nation thinks its system is the best. Well, maybe not every nation. It's a little hard to believe that Zimbabwe does right now. But anyway, um, Swedes, for instance, they say, look, We've got a higher standard of living than, than America, for instance. We've got a longer lifespan than almost any other country on the earth. We're great. But Swedes cannot tell themselves, we are the dominant culture on the planet. We are the dominant economy. We are the dominant military. We, the United States, are those three things. Uh, the dominant culture, that hit me upside the head about two Olympics, Olympics ago when I saw the Chinese female divers high-fiving each other after a really good dive. Well, they did not learn that out in Xinjiang province, you know. They learned that from America, indeed, in that case, from, from Africa, America, if you will. Uh, so in, in those ways, we are the dominant culture, military, and, and economy. So I think it's easier for us to be ethnocentric uh, than, and 
also I think it's stupider for us to because the, the thing wrong with ethnocentrism is it basically keeps you from learning from your own mistakes because you don't see them you don't admit them and it also keeps you from learning from other cultures because you already know yours is better is that how ethnocentrism becomes xenophobia sure sure it's related um, is, 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 to, to Hitler did his whole blood and air, sure. you know, blood and earth. Sure. We are the soil. And, we and are the Aryan supremacy and Germany yeah. has always been a great country, and it's only the Jews that have kept us from reaching our destiny and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, it, it seems like uh, I, I realize, you know, the old cliche: he who mentions the Nazis first loses the argument. But but it, that it seems like we would have learned the lessons of of jingoistic nationalism. Yeah, we learned that what they did was wrong. <laughs> but we didn't learn that what we do is wrong. And we kicked you know? our butts, right? Yeah. We learned that. I mean, I was just, uh, I just spent part of today reading about, and I think you're going to have a segment about this, I think I heard you say mm -hmm. that, uh, about the war crimes of, well, I was thinking first of Vietnam, I was reading some, I needed to do some research about My Lai and so on, right. uh, the My Lai massacre. And nobody in our country, almost nobody ever gets brought to trial for anything wrong we do. Uh, the exception is Lieutenant Kelly, who yeah. got three years of house arrest uh, for murdering at least 19 people. And otherwise, it's very, very difficult to call people to task, especially the, the architects of the policy. You know, I mean, when, when General Westmoreland back then, and we can talk about Rumsfeld in, in uh, Iraq and so on, when, they, when Westmoreland says, uh, essentially, the Iraqi, and the, the Iraqi people, that was a slip, the Vietnamese people are the enemy, and we've got to keep the body count up, and, and uh, that's how we measure our progress. But isn't that an invitation to war crimes? So I don't think that's a radical thing to say. I think that's just an honest thing to say if you read the, the historical record. Why can't we face our past? On Honestly, we certainly want Germany to. You know. Yeah, and, and, and you've done a marvelous job with Lies My Teacher Told Me in doing that. I'm curious about what we, uh, in the, the Fire Sign Theater this has stuff. this old saying, uh, yeah. everything you know is wrong, you know? Yeah. Uh, what, what everything we know is wrong about, about the, the Civil War. Civil War. Yeah, this book, of course, it has the Confederate flag on the front. Um, it tells the Confederate story, but not the way that it's being told these days. Um, I have asked more than 5,000 people, mostly teachers, uh, around the U.S. for about the last six or seven years, why did the South secede? I always get four answers. I get they seceded for slavery, for states' rights, because of the election of Lincoln, or tariffs and taxes, or arguments about the same. And then I ask these teachers to vote. And overwhelmingly, whether I am asking in North Carolina, where I did it first, or in northern Minnesota, where I happen to do it second, or in North Dakota, where I've done it, or an overall overwhelmingly black audience in Memphis, or Central Florida, or Cleveland, or Southern California, always states' rights wins a clear majority, about 60 to 70 percent of my of my huge audiences of teachers say states' hmm. rights. Now, what's the matter with that? Well, it's completely false is what's the matter with it. As the southern states leave the Union, and that's why this is called a reader, because it includes what they say as they leave the Union, uh, South Carolina first and then each one says, we are upset with states' rights. We are seceding because we are mad at some states and the rights they're trying to um, Manifest, for instance, be the free states. You mean? Free states. Pennsylvania, for instance, is messing around with the Fugitive Slave Act a little bit. They say we know it's a national act; we can't do anything about it. But um, we can, and then they proceed to do little things, like they pass a law saying we know that our gendarmes, our state police, our deputy sheriffs, and so on, that they have the job of tracking down any escaped slave and stuff. You do what you have to under this bill. But we're not paying you for that time. All right, mm. This totally upsets South Carolina. South Carolina is upset by New York because New York no, no longer allows what's called slavery transit or temporary slavery. It used to be, for instance, the, the nice white folks from Charleston didn't want to spend August in Charleston. I understand that having done it recently. Uh, so they'd rather go to New York City and see some plays. Mm -hmm. But they'd like to bring their cook along. And New York now says, uh-uh. If you bring your enslaved cook into New York, we're trying to run a free state. She becomes free. South Carolina is outraged about this. It's one of the reasons she secedes. Well, that was the basis of the Dred Scott decision. The Dred Scott went up to Minnesota yes. with his master. And exactly. When, and, and when he came back down south, he said, hey, wait a minute. I was in exactly. a free state. I'm free now. Yeah. And, and so the issue 
uh, he, well, that was trickier because Minnesota, I think, was a territory then. Yes. Uh, there's no question that New York does have the right to do this within. They're even mad at New Hampshire because New Hampshire lets blacks vote. Now, who the heck votes in America is the state's right at this point. It's not until the 15th Amendment that you mentioned earlier, passed two whole eras later and during Reconstruction, right. that it becomes a national matter. So what business is it of South Carolina's? Well, they make it their business using the Dred Scott as an example. They, they say, look, we've got this law, this decision that says black folks have no rights a white person needs to respect, and here you New Hampshireans are letting them vote. This is an outrage. We've had enough. We're seceding. Wow. So they're seceding against states' rights and totally about slavery. Yeah. And yet, most teachers teach it exactly backward, which really shows the power of neo-Confederates. That's why the book is called The Confederate and Neo-Confederate Reader, um, right now, the in, new in 2012. The, the reinvention. It's interesting. I, I grew up in Michigan, and I learned as a child in school that the South seceded in large part to protect slavery, but also to protect an agrarian way of life, you know, cotton and whatnot, and the North was industrializing. My children grew up in Atlanta, and in the public schools, they learned that the South seceded because the Northern bankers were ripping off the Southern plantation oh, arms. <laughs> and more BS. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's just, it's really quite remarkable. Um, sundown towns. One of your books is, is yeah. about sundown towns. Uh, we, we have about let's, three minutes here. I'd like to get into let's I, tell I, them what I, a I don't want to miss that. Is. Okay. Yes, please. A sundown town is a town that's all white on purpose. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, they get their name. I need to say that a lot of towns are all white on purpose in, for instance, Pennsylvania or in Maryland, but the term isn't used much east of Ohio. Uh, but nevertheless, they're sundown towns. Uh, the, the name comes from places like, for instance, Manitowoc, Wisconsin, which up until the 19, late 1960s or maybe even 1970, had a sign at its city limits saying, nigger, don't let the sun go down on you in Manitowoc. Same sign in Hawthorne, California. Same sign in Pekin, Illinois. And you don't have to have a sign, as I mentioned. When I went to write this book, having I grew up in the, the middle of Illinois, as I mentioned earlier, I knew I was going to do more research in Illinois than any other single state. I thought I would end up with maybe 10 sundown towns in Illinois, maybe 50 across the country. I had no well, they idea. They had these signs with the N-word on them. Well, they don't always have to have the sign, as I say. Yeah. Uh, but but they can have a, they, they think they Several towns, for instance, actually sounded a whistle at 6 p.m. In fact, some still sound it as we speak to tell blacks to be gone. Now, they will deny, wow. some people will deny that that's the purpose. They're just saying, well, it's the 6 o'clock whistle. But if you interview folks in the town, they say, yeah, well, that's what that whistle means. Well, you wouldn't want to be a black person, a black resident in that town at 6.01. I right. mean, you really wouldn't. So it can be a whistle. It can be just a, a known fact, you know. Uh, Often there was no, not even an ordinance, but the city police would still enforce it. And this it. is still with us. There are still many. I was in a county in Illinois three years ago, just as Barack Obama was taking office. This was January three years ago. This county, Calhoun County, is north of St. Louis, voted for Obama 52-46, just as did the United States, same percentage. Right. Uh, and no black household has lived there for decades. There's been repeated stories of people who have been, black people who have been hanged for being there after dark and so on. I asked a, a good person, uh, a person of goodwill, I said, do you think a black family could move here today? And she said, I really don't think so. She said, maybe if Obama works some miracles, maybe in three or four years, but not now. Well, that's an example. What, uh, what do we do about this? Well, I have two, two suggestions. First, I want to out them all. And so if any of your viewers know of a sundown town, email me about it. Okay. Jay Lowen, J-L-O-E-W-E-N, at U-V-M. I still get my email at the University of Vermont.edu. I'd love to hear from you. They're at my website. Uh, that is, the ones I know about. So that's the first step towards healing, to admit it. Uh, and then the second thing is, um, I think we have to make cause with the good people in the lots, most of the folks aren't in favor of this. But if you have a 2% thug minority that thinks this is the right thing to do, to throw a brick through their window if they move in or to beat up their kids at school, then the family almost has to leave. And then I do have a third proposal, and that is I actually think that uh, white households in sundown towns or sundown counties should lose their, home, their homestead interest mortgage interest deduction from their income tax. 
Okay, and if, as soon as that happened, then suddenly they'd want to they, they find a black householder. Dr. James Lowen, thank you so much for being with us. Today. Sure, it's okay. been a, it's been an honor uh, to see this and more conversations with the great minds. Go to our website at conversationswithgreatminds.com.